Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and in this video, I'm going to be teaching you how to play Voidfall. Voidfall is an epic space strategy game for one to four players set in a dark and distant future. The once flourishing empire of Dominaeum is no more. Great leaders and mighty fleets have lost their humanity, corrupted by an entity more ancient than the universe itself, the Voidborn. Now it is time for the Great Houses to purge this corruption and overthrow the chaos. Each player plays as one of these Great Houses, building fleets and expanding their control over the galaxy. You must manage your resources carefully, plan your actions, develop new technologies, and gain influence by pushing your own agendas. In this video, I'm going to be explaining the rules for the 2-4 player competitive game. For the full details of the solo and the cooperative modes, refer to the relevant sections of the rulebook. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're only going to be playing this solo or cooperatively, that you won't benefit from watching this video, as a lot of the rules are the same. For this video, I'm using the components from the Retail Edition. If you have some of the add-ons, your game will look different, but the rules are the same. In addition to this video, the best way to learn Voidfall is to first play through the tutorial, which uses a cut-down set of the rules and limits your options at the start of the game. This will get you used to the core mechanisms without overwhelming you with choices. A big thank you to Mind Clash Games for sponsoring this video, and if you want to support me directly, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules for exclusive access to the community and some additional bonus content. These are the setup instructions for a 2-4 player competitive game. If you're playing the tutorial, some steps will be different. Make sure that you follow the tutorial setup guide carefully. The scenarios in the compendium are divided into solo, co-op and competitive. Choose one of those listed for your chosen mode of play. Then look to the right to see what page to turn to for the full details of that scenario. That page will contain a lot of information that you'll need later in setup. Take the sector tiles and separate out the four home sectors. Each home sector is double-sided, with a standard home sector on one side and a special home sector on the other. Similarly, the remaining sector tiles have a standard sector on one side, which are all identical, but they have special sectors on the reverse. Look at the map layout for your chosen scenario and note any purple hexes which indicate special sectors. Look at the icon in the middle of the hex and find the corresponding special sectors, as indicated on the icon on the left of the tile. For our chosen scenario, we would need the Paradise World sector, as well as three Asteroid Belt sectors. Begin to set up the map in the middle of the play area according to the layout for your chosen scenario. For this scenario, the special sectors are in the middle of the map, so it makes sense to place those first. The lighter hexes on the map are standard sectors, so place those next. For each of the darker hexes on the map with a home icon in the middle, place a home sector standard side up. Place void storm tokens on the borders between two sectors as indicated by the diagram. Void storms are effectively a barrier between the two sectors, making them not adjacent to each other. If the map diagram has any harbingers shown around the outside of the map, place tokens as indicated. Some scenarios depict Harbinger tokens actually in a hex. In these cases, place Harbinger tokens in the sectors. For each hex with an indicated population value, place a purple population die on it set to the correct value. If the icon in the diagram has orange lines coming out of it, that population starts the game corrupted. Place a corruption marker under the die to indicate that they are corrupted. In our scenario, all purple population dice start off corrupted, apart from the population of the Paradise World, which is such a nice place it can never be corrupted. In some scenarios, a special sector might show a black die, indicating that you should use a black fixed population die instead of a purple one. For each hex on the diagram with Voidborn Fleet Power, place a Voidborn Fleet token in the sector with the corresponding number of Fleet Power cubes. If a hex has a glory value, place a glory token of the corresponding value in the sector. This triangular icon indicates a sector defense installation is present in the sector. Place the token on the leftmost installation space. Note that some special sectors, such as our asteroid belts, already come with pre-printed sector defenses. These are not indicated on the diagram as they are already printed on the sector itself. Create a common supply of bounty tokens and reclaim tokens, ensuring that each token is face down. Place bounty tokens and reclaim tokens at random in each sector that requires them, according to the diagram. Ensure that you keep the tokens face down. Check the scenario to see which fallen houses are used, and then take the corresponding fallen house cards. Shuffle them, and then place one at random face up on each of the hexes depicting a torn flag. Return any leftovers to the box. 
Place a corruption marker on the population space along with a purple population die set to the value as depicted on the fallen house card. At this stage of setup, the home sector should be empty along with what are called outpost sectors, each of which is adjacent to a home sector. After setting up the map, you need to create the agenda display before players set up their individual houses because the cards revealed in this next step might impact on your choices. Place the agenda board nearby. Take the agenda cards and divide them by type as depicted on the back. Shuffle each stack separately and place them on the matching spaces on the left side of the agenda board. Take the top card from each stack and place it face up on the right of the board. Each player then chooses a house to play from the ones listed in your scenario. Take the mat for your chosen house and place it in front of you. Take the two origin cards belonging to your house and choose which of them you want to use for the game, returning the other to the box. The back of the mat contains some flavour text and some strategy depending on which origin card you chose. Take a glory token value 2 and place it to the left of your house mat. Each player chooses a colour to play and takes the following components in that colour. An influence tracker initially set to 10. This is your victory point and the player with the most influence at the end of the game wins. 14 fleet power cubes, a turn order marker, a population die and 9 focus cards with your coloured stripe on the left side. Some houses require special focus cards that replace ones from the standard 9. House Astoran, for example, has their own special focus cards for Prosperity and Conquest, which replace the original ones. Some houses replace a basic focus card with a completely different one. Here, for example, House Nervo replaced their Conquest card with their unique Uplift card. On your house mat, place a Corruption marker on the rightmost agenda slot. Place Civilization track markers on the leftmost space of each of your Civilization tracks. Your chosen Origins card has a lot of information on it. Let's go through it now, step by step. The top of the card indicates your starting technology. Here, for example, the House Astoran Origin card B indicates sentries. Find the three technology cards of this type. Two of them are basic technologies, and one of them is an improved technology. Place the improved technology next to your mat. You are the only player in the game who can develop that technology. Take the basic technology marked with the plus 4 influence and tuck it under any of the slots at the top of your house mat. Normally, during the game, you would gain the 4 influence and the bonus printed at the bottom of the card that you have just covered over, but that does not apply to setup. If playing with fewer than 3 players, return the second basic technology card to the box. It is not needed. With 3 or 4 players, place it on the table in an area known as the technology tableau, along with the second basic technology card from each of the other players. From the remaining technology cards, take the three cards for each of the eight technologies listed for your chosen scenario. Take the improved versions of those technologies and set those cards aside for now. For the basic versions, stack the two cards of each type on top of each other with the one depicting four influence on top and place them in the technology tableau, which should be the eight stacks that you've just added, plus the one per player from earlier if playing with three or four players. Each player chooses a home sector on the map closest to where they are sat. Some houses have a special home sector. This is indicated on your origin card if the home sector is highlighted in yellow. And if you do have a special home sector, flip over the home sector tiles or look through the ones not in the game until you find the one for your house, and then place that in the home sector position nearest where you are sat. Each player then sets up their home sector and outpost sector as per their origin card. Place your own coloured population die on the space in your home sector set to the value depicted in the upper hex. Note this icon here near the space means that this population can never be corrupted. In your outpost sector, place a purple population die set to the value depicted in the lower hex. Neither of the two starting sectors for this Origins card start off corrupted, but that isn't always the case. The Origins A card for House Xenor indicates that their outpost sector starts out corrupted. And the Origins B card for House Navaris indicates that their home sector starts off corrupted. Place the indicated type of fleet token in each of your sectors along with the depicted number of fleet power cubes as shown. For example, House Astoran's Origin B card starts with two fleet power of corvettes in their home sector and one corvette and one sentry in their outpost sector. Place the depicted guild tokens on the leftmost spaces of your home and outpost sectors as indicated. For example here, you place one miners guild in your home sector and one engineers guild in your outpost sector. Place any depicted installations in your sectors. Here, you place a sector defence in your outpost sector. 
Note that most home sectors come with a pre-printed shipyard. There is no need to place an installation token on this space. Place the indicated number of fleet power cubes in the active area of your house mat. In this case, just one. Place the remainder of your fleet power cubes into the inactive area. Check that you have 14 in total, divided between the two areas on your house mat and your sectors on the map. These cubes are limited and you'll never have more than 14. Your origin card may also have some additional setup steps in this section here. I won't cover them all in this video, but they are all listed in the compendium. One very important thing about any of these additional things that you might start with is that any bonuses you would normally get for these has already been calculated into your setup totals. For example, if your Origins card tells you to advance on one of your Civilization tracks, just move the marker. Do not get the bonus for the space that you moved onto. An exception to this is if you gain any bounty tokens. Take those at random from the supply, gain the benefits of them, and then place them to the left of your house mat. Each player takes a resource board and puts it in front of them. Set each dial to the value listed on your Origin card. For the numbers on the left, these indicate what the white number should be set to on the left of the dial. And for the numbers on the right, these indicate what the number in the window should be set to, which is how many of each resource you currently have. Food, energy, materials, credits and science. That's everything from the origin card done, so flip it over and tuck it under the leftmost agenda slot on your house mat. Place the galactic board on the table. Use this side of it for a competitive game. Take the trade tokens and place them as follows. In a two-player game, place one token on each space and return the remaining six to the box. In a three-player game, place two tokens on each space except for the bottom one, returning the remaining two tokens to the box. And in a four-player game, place two tokens on each space. We're setting up a three-player game, so the board will look like this. Take the turn order marker for each player in the game and place them at random on the leftmost spaces of the turn order track. This indicates the player order for the first cycle of the game. Take the eight improved technology cards that you set aside earlier, shuffle them and place four of them at random face up on the spaces at the top of the galactic board. Place the remaining cards face down nearby. Place the blocking tile over the top of the cards on the board. This tile shows that these cards cannot be taken in the first cycle of the game. Take the galactic event cards and divide them into three stacks based on their backs. One for cycle one, one for cycle two and one for cycle three. Then for each stack, Take the cards needed for your chosen scenario. For Peace and Prosperity, it shows cards C, D and E. So we need cards C, D and E from each stack. Return the rest of the cards to the box. They are not needed. Shuffle each of the three stacks separately and place them face down below the galactic board. Place the main combat tile nearby. Check the technologies in the game. If there are sentries, destroyers, dreadnoughts, carriers or star bases, Take the corresponding combat tile and place it underneath the main combat tile. Our game just has sentries and star bases, so these two tiles are added. These tiles show the combat abilities for all of the fleet types in the game. Return any unused combat tiles to the box. In a common supply nearby, along with the bounty and reclaim tokens, you will need the glory tokens, the different fleet tokens for the fleets in the game, the guilds, installations, voidborn cubes and corruption markers. The final part of setup is to take your nine focus cards and put them into your hand. Find the innovation card and place it into your personal discard pile. As you can see on the card, this card cannot be played in cycle one of the game. The rest of the cards start off in your hand and you are now ready to play. A game of Voidfall is divided into three cycles with each cycle divided into three phases, A, B and C, which is summarized on the galactic board. Phase A is the preparation phase and consists of four steps where you set things up for the cycle ahead. In the first cycle of the game, most of the preparation has been done for you, so the only step from phase A that you do in cycle one is step four where you determine the galactic event. Phase B is the focus phase, which consists of a number of rounds based on the galactic event. In each of those rounds, players take a turn in the order of the markers here. On your turn, you perform the three steps as shown here which involves playing one of your focus cards and then performing two or three of the actions listed on the card. Phase C is the evaluation phase, where the Voidborn strike back. You must pay for upkeep and then the galactic objectives are evaluated, which is a way to get bonuses if you've met the conditions on the card. And then finally, each player gains influence based on their uncorrupted agenda cards. After three cycles, the game ends and the player with the most influence wins the game.
The preparation phase is the first phase of each cycle, and you perform the four steps shown on the galactic board. In the first cycle of the game, you skip steps 1 to 3, but I'll explain them now so that you know what happens at the start of cycles 2 and 3. This is our board at the start of cycle 2. In step 1, you remove the bottommost trade token back to the box. In step 2, you update the improved technology offer. At the start of cycle 2, you remove the blocking tile, making the four improved technologies available. Some of them may be taken during cycle 2. And at the start of cycle 3, remove any cards still present and return them to the box. Then, take the four cards that were set aside during setup and place them on the spaces. These are the ones available during cycle 3. Step 3 is to determine the turn order for the cycle. The player with the least influence selects where they want to go in turn order first, then the player with the next lowest influence, and so on. If players are tied for the same influence, the player who was later in the previous cycle's turn order chooses first. Normally, it's best to go first in a cycle, but not always. You may want to go first to grab some technology before someone else does, or you may want to go last to react to what the other players do. Step 4, which is the first step that you do in cycle 1, as the three previous steps are skipped, is to take the top galactic event from the deck and place it face up on the space here. The remaining galactic events for that cycle are no longer needed and can be returned to the box. The left side of the galactic event has multiple text boxes on it. Resolve each of those in order from top to bottom. If the box has a solid border, you must carry out all of the instructions in that box in full. Here, for example, all players, indicated by this icon, must place one Voidborn fleet power and a value one glory token on a Voidborn sector adjacent to them. If some parts of the instructions cannot be carried out, you skip it completely. But if the instructions affect multiple hexes, you look at each sector individually, skipping a sector if the instructions cannot be carried out in full for that sector. If the box has a dashed border, the instruction may be carried out or not. Here, for example, all players may choose to activate one fleet power, or increase the population of a non-corrupted sector, or establish a banker's guild. Don't worry, you don't need to remember all of this iconography, although it is very intuitive once you start to learn the game. A full list of all of the galactic events can be found in the glossary. And there is the icon reference to refer to as a quick lookup. The two effects that we've just seen affect all players, but that isn't always the case. The icon in the top left of the box tells you whether each player resolves it individually, or it's resolved once as a group, or it's an ongoing effect for the rest of the cycle, or it is a delayed effect that only takes effect after each player's first turn during phase B. The focus phase is where players take turns to play cards and perform actions. It's where most of the gameplay happens. This phase is comprised of a fixed number of rounds as determined by the current galactic event. In each round, players take a turn in the order of the markers on the turn order track. On your turn, you follow the three steps shown here. First, you select one of the focus cards from your hand and play it. You will get to perform two of the three actions on that card in step two. Additionally, if you have a trade token, you may flip it over and place it on your focus card. If you do, you will get to perform all three actions of the card instead of just two of them. Note that to use a trade token in this way, you must have it at the start of your turn during step one. You cannot gain a trade token when performing your actions and then use that trade token to perform an extra action. Also, if you have an agenda card in hand, I'll explain later on how you get these, you can play this at the same time as your focus card. But to do this, the focus card you play must match one of the two icons on your agenda card. And like trade tokens, to play an agenda card, it must be in your hand at the start of your turn. Step two of your turn is where you perform actions. As mentioned, if you did not use a trade token, you will get to do any two of the actions in any order you want to. If you did use a trade token, you get to do all three actions in any order. If you played an agenda card, that also has an action on it, which you can perform before, after, or in between the actions on your focus card. I'm not going to cover all of the actions at this point in the video, but I will cover the general rules for them. Many actions have a cost. To perform the action, you must pay the cost, and if you cannot afford it, you cannot perform the action. If an action has two effects split with a green line and this icon, it means that you can perform either or both of the effects. If the action has a red line and this icon, you can perform only one of the effects. Step three of your turn is cleanup, where you check the four things shown here. First, for each sector that has more than two of your fleet tokens, you must remove tokens until you have a maximum of two. 
You do this by recalling your fleet power cubes one by one. For example, here you have three fleet tokens, two for corvettes and one for sentries, having two fleet power on each. You could lose the sentries, recalling the two fleet power cubes from there. Or you could move one of the cubes from one of the corvette tokens to the other and then lose the token with only one cube. When you recall fleet power, place it back in your active area of your mat. Next, check your glory tokens. If you have more than four of them at this stage, return tokens back to the supply until you have only four. And no, you cannot merge two lower values into a higher value to avoid discarding one. Next, if you played an agenda card this turn, you have three options of what to do with it. You can place it into an empty slot below your mat, but only if the agenda type shown in the bottom left is different from every other agenda card you have. Or you could remove one of your non-starting agendas and replace it with your new one, as long as the new one is of a different type to all of your others. If you do replace an agenda, place the one that you replaced on the bottom of the corresponding agenda deck. Or instead of doing either of those, you could just place the agenda on the bottom of the corresponding deck. Note that you are allowed to place an agenda in a corrupted slot, but it won't score any influence for you until that slot is made pure. Now, it may seem odd to play an agenda card at the start of your turn and then just discard it at the end of your turn, but if you really wanted to do the action on the card, then sometimes it's worth doing. Next, if you flipped a trade token at the start of your turn, return it to the galactic board now, placing it on the highest available space, depending on your player count. For example, in a three-player game, each space can have two tokens, so you would return it here. For each other trade token you have, you cannot just keep it. You must place it on the bottom right corner of an agenda card below your mat that doesn't already have a trade token on it. And if you don't have a space for it, or you just want to, return the token to the galactic board. And finally, place the focus card you played into your discard pile. Your turn is now over. Once the number of rounds have been played according to this round's galactic event card, the focus phase ends and you proceed to the evaluation phase. The evaluation phase is where the Voidborn strike back, players perform upkeep, the galactic objectives are resolved, followed by each player scoring their agendas. In step one, each player checks to see if the Voidborn attack one of their sectors, causing a skirmish. I'll explain skirmishes in a lot more detail later in the video, but what I will mention at this stage is if you have no sectors adjacent to a Voidborn sector and no sectors with a Harbinger token on the edge, you are safe. The other players, however, maybe not. In step two, calculate your total upkeep as follows. Each agenda card below your mat that doesn't have its corner covered by a trade token requires two upkeep. Then check each of your sectors. If you have an installation or guild on a space with an upkeep icon, that's another one upkeep. Some sectors even require upkeep just for being in control of the sector. For each upkeep, you must pay either one food or a total of two materials and or energy. Let's say your total upkeep is three. You only have two food, so you pay this, and then for the missing food, you pay either two energy, two materials, or one of each. And note that you could just choose to pay in energy and materials and save the food. It just costs more. You must pay the upkeep if you can, but if you're unable to pay, you lose three influence for each upkeep that you cannot pay for. Step three of the evaluation phase is where you look at the galactic objectives for the current cycle. Two objectives are listed. If there's a red line between them, you can choose only one of the two. If there's a green line between them, you can evaluate both. If there's an equals to sign between the condition and the benefit, it means that you need to have met the condition in order to get the benefit. In this case, you need to have 10 or more population in pure non-corrupted sectors. If you do, you gain the benefit listed below. In this case, you get to establish a guild of your choice and or build an installation of your choice. If there's a multiply sign between the condition and the benefit, it means that you get the benefit a number of times equal to how many times you meet the condition. For example, here you gain two influence for each pure sector with one or more guilds that generate food, material or energy. A full list of all of the galactic events can be found in the glossary. The final step of the phase is to score influence for each of your agendas. You only score for uncorrupted agendas, so if you have a corruption marker on one, try to remove it somehow before you score it. Here you will only score for your first two agendas. Each agenda lists a number of sections which are evaluated individually. Similar to the way that galactic objectives work, these can be a fixed amount of influence if you meet the condition, or they could be a multiplier. 
For example, this starting agenda gives you one influence for each population in your pure sectors, that is, ones without a corruption marker. You then gain two influence for each of your pure sectors that has one or more sentries in it, one influence for each of your pure sectors that has one or more sector defences in it, but you lose two influence for each corruption marker on your house mat. Your second agenda scores five influence if you have six or less total upkeep. And you score five influence for every two engineers guilds in pure sectors. Note that every agenda only ever scores for pure sectors. A corrupted sector will never score for agendas. A full list of all of the agendas can be found in the glossary. If that was the end of cycle one or two, each player picks up all of their focus cards from their discard pile and then you proceed to the next cycle. That includes the innovation card which you weren't allowed to play in cycle one. Or if you've just finished cycle three, the game is over. The player with the most influence wins, if tied, the one with the fewest corruption markers wins, and if still tied, players share the victory. Your resource board is where you track your production capabilities and how many resources you have. The visible numbers on the right side of the board indicate how many resources you currently have of the five types – food, energy, materials, credits and science. Whenever you gain resources, rotate the dials accordingly. The maximum you can have of any resource is 15. Whenever you spend resources, rotate the dials the other way. You cannot spend what you do not have. As indicated here, credits may be used as a substitute for food, energy or materials when spending. Credits cannot be used instead of science. For example, if you need to pay three food but you only have one, you could spend one food and two credits. Or if you wanted to, you could just spend three credits. The only time that you are not allowed to use credits in place of food, energy or materials is when paying upkeep. The left side of the resource board tracks your production levels on the left of the dial and the production yields in the window. Your initial production levels were set by your origin card and I just wanted to take a minute to explain how that was determined. Each guild you have provides you with one production level per population in the sector with the guild. For example here, in your home sector, you have a miners guild that produces materials and the population is three. That gives you a production level of three for materials. And in your outpost sector, you have an engineering guild that produces energy. The population is two, so that gives you a production level of two for energy. Also, your origins card depicts a starting bonus here. In this case, food production increases by one level. So this is why House Astoran, using the Origins B card, starts with production levels of one for food, two for energy, and three for materials. Note, however, that production levels and production yields are different things. It's not a linear scale, and it is different for credits than for the other resources. Each time you add a new guild to a sector or the population changes, you must recalculate your production levels. For example, if you build a banker's guild here, your credits production level increases by three. And then if you later increase the population from three to four, your production levels of materials and credits increase by one. Some special sectors also give you a production bonus if you control them. The asteroid belt sector, for example, gives you a plus one to your energy and material production levels. During the game, you will get to produce resources. These icons, for example, indicate that you produce food, energy and materials whereas this icon allows you to produce a resource of your choice. To produce, gain resources equal to the production yield value. So here, if you produce materials, you gain three materials. The most you can have of any resource is 15. This iconography, which is on each resource, says that when producing, if you would go over 15, you gain an overproducing bonus of three influence, regardless of the amount that you would have gone over. For example, you currently have six energy. You produce energy, gaining 10 more, but you can only gain 9 up to the maximum of 15. You then gain 3 influence for overproducing. And note that the overproducing bonus only applies specifically when you produce, not when you just gain resources. So if you were on 14 food and a game effect that wasn't production said gain 2 food, you would not get the 3 influence. Most sectors have a number of spaces where you can establish guilds and other spaces where you can build installations. Each guild is tied to one of the five resources. Sometimes you will be able to establish a guild of your choice, such as with the grow action of the development card. Other times you can only establish a guild of a specific type, such as the experiment action of the progress card, which allows you to establish a scientist guild. Whenever you establish a guild, take one of the type you need and place it on the leftmost empty guild space in a sector that you control. 
you are allowed to have multiple guilds of the same type in a sector. And as mentioned earlier, establishing a guild immediately increases your production level of the corresponding resource by the population of the sector. So here, establishing a scientist guild in a sector with a population of two increases your science production level by two. It's also very important to note that even if a sector is corrupted, it still counts towards your resource production as normal. The three possible installations are shipyards, sector defences and starbases. Sometimes you will be able to build an installation of your choice, such as with the settle action of the development card. Other times you can only build an installation of a specific type, such as the mobilise action of the reinforcement card. To build an installation, take one of the type you need and place it on the leftmost empty installation space in a sector you control. You are allowed to have multiple installations of the same type in a sector. Shipyards help you build more ships and sector defences help protect the sector from invaders. Starbases are special. Even if the action on the card allows you to build a starbase, you can only do so if you have the starbase's technology card. Once built, they act as a shipyard and a sector defence combined. Once placed, guilds and installations cannot voluntarily be removed or overbuilt. However, there are some game effects which instruct you to destroy a guild or installation. To do this, remove the token and then slide any remaining ones to the left. Sectors with permanent guilds or installations such as this pre-printed shipyard work as normal, but they can never be removed or replaced. Most sectors have a population value indicated by the value of the population die. Various effects in the game can increase or decrease population, but this can only ever be done if the sector is pure, in other words not corrupted. For example, this effect here is to increase the population, and the icons to the left remind you that this can only be done in a pure sector. To increase population, simply increase the value on the die by 1. Population can never go above 6. As mentioned earlier, a change in population immediately affects the production levels based on the gills in the sector. So here, the production levels of energy and food both go up by 1. Some effects decrease population. This can only be done in non-home sectors, and you can never reduce population below 1. Note that a sector with a fixed population die, which are the black ones with the red pips, can never be changed. A fleet is a large group of ships represented by a fleet token of the appropriate type and between 1 and 3 fleet power cubes. There are 5 types of fleet in the game, each with their own combat capabilities. Only corvettes are available to everyone. To build any of the other types of fleet, you need the corresponding technology card. Fleet power cubes are limited to 14 for each player. They are either inactive, active or deployed into a sector on the map. Fleets can be merged or split at any time. If you have a token with two cubes for example, you can split it into two ones. And similarly, you can merge those two ones into a single two at any time. But you can only merge fleets if they are of the same type. If a fleet token ever has no cubes, remove the token from the map. Whenever you see this icon, you activate the depicted number of fleet power by moving them from your inactive area to your active area. And similarly, this icon means that you must deactivate fleet power, moving it from active to inactive. This icon means that you have to recall one fleet power. On this card, this is the cost of taking the settle action. To recall fleet power, remove a cube from a fleet token on the map and place it back in your active area. And this is also how damage in combat works. Whenever you take damage in combat, you recall one fleet power, returning it to your active area. Just going back to deactivating fleet power for a minute, if you ever need to deactivate a fleet power but you don't have any cubes in your active area, you must first recall one fleet power from somewhere on the map and then deactivate that power. I would try to avoid removing the last fleet power from a non-home sector. If you do, you are abandoning that sector, which I'll cover later on. This icon means that you deploy the depicted number of fleet power. To do this, move cubes from your active area and place them on the map, either adding them to an existing fleet token or placing a new fleet token and adding the cube to it. Remember that you can only build corvettes unless you have the technology to build other types of fleet. And also, deploying dreadnoughts and carriers costs extra, as indicated on the technology card. Each dreadnought costs one material to deploy, and each carrier costs one food to deploy. One common way to deploy fleet power is with the muster action on the reinforcement card. This allows you to deploy one fleet power for each shipyard you have, into the sector with the shipyard. 
So here you can deploy two fleet power to this sector with two shipyards and one fleet power here with one shipyard. Sometimes the icon will tell you to deploy to your home sector only. And sometimes you will be instructed to deploy a specific type of fleet. This for example is to deploy a destroyer to your home sector. Voidborne fleets are essentially corrupted corvettes and behave in combat like regular corvettes. Most sectors are limited to one Voidborne fleet token, with a maximum of three fleet power. Some special sectors may contain two or even three Voidborne fleet tokens, as indicated by these icons on the sector itself. These sectors can have a maximum of six and nine fleet power respectively. If you ever have a choice of which sector to place a Voidborne fleet power into, you must choose a sector where you are able to place it. There are two ways in the game in which you can move fleets around on the map, regroup and invade. When you regroup, you make up to a total of five moves, with each move being one fleet power from one sector to an adjacent sector. You must control both of those sectors. You can move the same fleet power more than once, but you may not abandon a non-home sector when regrouping. That is, you must leave behind at least one fleet power. Your home sector is special. You may leave that empty if you want to. For example, with five moves, you could split this fleet of three corvettes here into a two and a one, moving the fleet with two power to here, splitting again, and then one of them moving to here. That is three moves. You can then merge the two corvette fleets together. And for the remaining two moves, you could move this destroyer from here to here, and then here. When you invade, choose a sector to attack. This could be a voidborne sector, a non-home sector controlled by another player, or a sector with no fleet power in it. Then you perform an invasion. Start by moving any number of your fleets that are adjacent to the target sector into the target sector. It is allowed to move in from multiple sectors. For example, you choose to invade this voidborne sector. You move in with the two corvettes from one sector and the destroyer from another. And you can have more than two fleet tokens in a sector at this point. You are only forced to discard down to two tokens at the end of your turn. And also, unlike with the regroup action, you may abandon a non-home sector when launching an invasion. If you do, however, the sector becomes abandoned, which I'll explain in a later chapter. The next step is to resolve combat and determine the outcome, which I'm going to explain next. There are two ways in the game that combat can take place. Either a player invades a sector, or during the evaluation phase where the Voidborn attack a player. Combat in Voidfall is completely deterministic. There are no random elements or hidden information. You can work out in advance exactly how the combat will go, and in fact, you should do this before attempting an invasion. In each combat, there is an invader, represented by this icon, and a defender, represented by this icon. Both sides in a combat use all of their fleet power in the sector, but the defender also uses any sector defences and star bases. Note that in combat, only the number of fleet power cubes and their type is important. There is no difference between two corvette tokens with one fleet power each, and one token with two power. If you invade a sector with no fleet power, there will still be sector defences or star bases, so there is still a combat. And, if you invade a sector with a fallen house card, any sector defences printed on the card are considered to be in the sector. The combat tiles summarise the combat sequence, showing exactly what happens in each step for the different types of fleets and installations. Combat is divided into two steps. First, resolve the approach step, which happens only once at the start of combat. Then, you keep repeating salvo steps over and over until one side has no more fleets left. As you can see at the top of the combat tiles, there are two types of damage and absorption, one for the approach step and one for the salvo step. I'm going to explain combat first with just the basic type of ship, the corvette, and the sector defences. I'll explain the other types of fleets later in the video. For example, you invade with four corvette fleets into a sector that has two voidborne fleets and one sector defence. In the approach step, each of the defender's sector defences deals one approach damage to the invader. For each damage suffered, the invader must recall one fleet power from any of their fleet tokens. So here, you suffer one damage and lose one of your corvettes. Note that only fleets can take damage, not installations, guilds or anything else in the sector. As you can see here, the corvettes do nothing in the approach step. Next is the first salvo. In each salvo, you first determine the initiative value for both sides, represented by the red exclamation mark. For both sides, each corvette fleet increases their initiative value by one. 
The side with the higher initiative fires first, but if both sides have the same initiative, they fire at the same time. In our example, you have three fleets and the Voidborn have two, so you fire first. The side with the initiative deals one damage to the other side, just one damage, irrespective of how many fleets you have. So here, you inflict one damage on the Voidborn. Then, the side with the lower initiative fires back, assuming they are still there and have an initiative value greater than zero. Again, they just deal one damage. The salvo step is repeated until one side has no fleet power remaining. So in our example, in the second salvo step, you have two initiative compared to the one of the Voidborn. You fire first and destroy the last Voidborn fleet. They have none left, so they don't fire back and the combat is over. But let's just take a look at what would have happened if you'd have only attacked with three fleets. The sector defences would have destroyed one of yours, meaning that in the first salvo you are tied on initiative, both dealing one damage to the other at the same time. And then in the second salvo, the same thing happens, causing mutual destruction. However, combat is rarely that simple. The different fleet types each have their own rules. And there are many technologies which can change the outcome, such as shields, torpedoes and so on. I'll cover those things in more detail later in the video, but the main thing to remember here is that there are no surprise elements. Everything can be determined before the combat actually takes place. A full breakdown of the combat sequence can be found in the rulebook. Before moving on, I wanted to cover the rules for damage absorption, of which there are two types, approach absorption and salvo absorption. And as you can probably guess, approach absorption only prevents approach damage and salvo absorption only prevents salvo damage. A Dreadnought fleet is a good example of approach absorption. This iconography here says that if you are the attacker, you get one approach absorption for each Dreadnought fleet you have. So going back to the previous example, if you included a Dreadnought as part of the invading fleets, it would absorb the approach damage from the sector defence. And the shields technology is a good example of salvo absorption. As long as you have at least one corvette in the combat, whether you are the invader or defender, you get one salvo absorption. And that is one total for the whole combat, not for every salvo. At the end of combat, if the defender is the one with fleet power remaining, they win the combat. They can breathe a sigh of relief, but there are no other rewards for winning as the defender. If, however, a player invades and is the only one with fleet power remaining, they win the combat and take control of the sector. There are four steps to perform which can be done in any order. Remove all installations from the sector. If there were any guilds in the sector, those are not removed. And if there were any guilds, you immediately update your production levels based on the guilds you are now in control of based on the population value in the sector. And if you captured the sector from another player, they must decrease their production levels accordingly. Flip over each bounty token and gain what is printed on them. Most bounty tokens give you a choice. This one, for example, is to gain two food or one influence. After gaining the reward, place the token face down next to your house mat. Resolve the reclaim tokens in the same way. Flip them over and gain the reward on them. This one, for example, allows you to establish a farmer's guild in this sector or to gain any one resource. Reclaim tokens are also placed face down next to your house mat. Take any glory tokens from the sector and place them with your others next to your house mat. Then, if the sector that you invaded was not controlled by another player, score influence equal to the total value of all of your glory tokens, even if you didn't gain a new token from the combat. So here, you would gain five influence. Note that at the end of your turn, you need to discard glory tokens in excess of four. So you could have more than four tokens at this stage and then discard the excess later. If, however, you successfully invaded another player's sector, you gain influence based on the total value of their glory tokens. In this case, seven influence. And then that player chooses one of their glory tokens and returns it to the supply. If you successfully invade a sector with a fallen house, gain the effects on the bottom of the fallen house card. In this case, you establish an Engineer's Guild in the sector. Then, choose one of the two technologies shown on the Fallen House card. And, as long as there is an available copy of it in the Technology Tableau, you gain that technology. Normally, you are limited to five technologies, but the first time you take over a Fallen House sector, you flip the Fallen House card over and keep it next to your house mat as a sixth technology slot. If, at the end of a combat, both sides have no fleet power remaining, then neither side wins. When this happens, neither player gets any benefit, but if the defender was a player, they must discard a glory token of their choice and the sector becomes abandoned, meaning that they lose control of it and they must adjust their production levels accordingly. 
One exception to this is if you invade a sector that has no fleet power, such as one with just sector defences, and you lose all of your fleets, it's counted as a victory for the defenders. But since combat is deterministic, you probably shouldn't even do this. The only invasion outcome I haven't mentioned is when the Voidborn attack one of your sectors and they win. I'll cover this in the next chapter. The first step of the evaluation phase is that each player in turn order must resolve a skirmish in which one of their sectors is invaded by the Voidborn. To resolve a skirmish, first determine the fleet power of the attack. This is equal to the number of corruption markers on your house mat, both on agenda spaces and your civilization tracks. Here, for example, you will be attacked by a Voidborn fleet power of two. Note that the decontaminations chamber technology allows you to store corruption on it. This corruption does not count towards Voidborn fleet power. Then, if it is cycle two or three, add one to this value as depicted here. So, in cycle one, if you have no corruption markers on your house mat, the invading fleet power is zero. Technically, this still counts as a skirmish, but you automatically succeed in defending. Voidborn fleet power is taken from the supply, not from any sectors on the map. Next, you need to determine where the Voidborn are invading. They can only target a sector which is adjacent to a sector containing Voidborn fleets, or a sector which has a Harbinger token in it, or on its edge. Here, for example, this sector and this sector are possible skirmish locations for the Voidborn attack on the blue player. And this sector is a possible skirmish location for the green player. Home sectors and also some special sectors are immune to Voidborn attacks, as indicated by this icon. If there are multiple possible targets, the Voidborn will prioritise a sector where they will win, or achieve mutual destruction, which although it isn't technically a win for the Voidborn, the end result is the same. Calculate this for each target to work out where they are invading. If there are still multiple targets, the Voidborn will target a sector where they can inflict the most damage, that is where you are forced to recall the most fleet power. And if still tied, refer to the four other tiebreakers in the rulebook to see which sector they attack. If there is no viable target, the attack doesn't happen at all. Once you've determined the Voidborn fleet power and where they are invading, resolve the combat normally. They are the invader and you are the defender. If you manage to win, huzzah! But remember, there are no rewards for defending successfully. However, if the Voidborn have any fleets left at the end of combat, or both sides wipe each other out, the Voidborn win the skirmish. If this happens, remove all installations from the sector, along with any Voidborn fleet if there are still any left. Then, discard one of your glory tokens, returning it to the supply. The sector then becomes abandoned, which I'm going to cover next. Just before moving on, I did want to mention that losing a sector to the Voidborn during the evaluation phase is something that you should try and avoid. Because the combat is deterministic, you can calculate in advance how much fleet power they will attack you with and where and you can work out what you need to do to defend yourself. Make sure you do this during the cycle so that you aren't caught by surprise at the end. Sectors can become abandoned in a variety of different ways. As I've just mentioned, if you are attacked by the Voidborn and they win, the sector becomes abandoned. It can also happen if you launch an invasion yourself and choose to move all of your fleets out of a sector, or if you are forced to recall the last fleet power from a sector. These rules only apply to non-home sectors. You can freely vacate your home sector and it will never become abandoned. When a sector becomes abandoned, remove all installations from the sector, but leave any guilds in place. Then, if the population was not corrupted, they are now. Place a corruption marker beneath the die. Next, place a Voidborn fleet token along with two fleet power into the sector. And finally, take a bounty token at random from the supply and place it face down into the sector. Some special sectors are resistant to corruption. If a sector has no population or this icon, no corruption marker is placed when the sector is abandoned. The other steps, however, are still performed. And if the sector has this icon, Voidborn fleets can never be placed in the sector. So if they are abandoned, no Voidborn fleets are placed and you also don't place the bounty token. It's also worth noting that if you lose control of a sector that has a special ability that affects your production, you lose that production bonus. Corruption is bad, and it can affect you in a number of different ways. If a sector is corrupted, you cannot change the value of the population die there, but the population still counts for production of resources. 
If an agenda slot is corrupted, you do not score that agenda during the evaluation phase. And if a civilization track is corrupted, you do not get the bonus when advancing your marker. This icon means that you gain corruption. It can be found as a cost on two of the actions on the Temptation Focus card. When you gain corruption, take a corruption marker from the supply and place it in a legal location, either below the population die in one of your pure sectors, except for a sector that's immune to corruption, or on one of your non-starting agenda slots that isn't already corrupted, or on one of your three civilization tracks that isn't already corrupted or on the decontamination technology if you have it. This icon means that you can move a corruption marker. When you move a corruption, take it from one position and put it back in another legal position. So you could move this corruption marker here to either of the other two civilization tracks or to this agenda slot. Or you could corrupt the population of a sector. Remember that a sector with this icon may never be corrupted. Sometimes you'll get to remove a corruption, such as the optimize action. Simply take one from either your house mat or one of your sectors and place it back in the supply. The effects of some of the galactic events will instruct you to gain corruption but to a specific place. These are all described in the rulebook. Each house has three civilization tracks, society, statecraft and economy. The four houses used in the tutorial all have the same tracks, but the other houses are all unique. You gain advancement on these tracks through various game effects. Some let you advance any track and some a specific track. When you advance on a track, move your marker to the next space. If that track is corrupted, you can still advance the marker, but you do not get the immediate benefit. However, if the track is pure, you immediately get the benefit of the space that you just moved to. The benefits of all of these spaces are fully explained in the glossary, and many of them are icons that we've seen before. One of them I did want to mention is this one, because you only see this benefit on civilization tracks and nowhere else in the game. It means that you skip this space and move your marker to the next space. But remember, that only applies if the track is not corrupted. Each track is divided into five tiers, numbered 0 to 4. To move any marker from tier 2 to 3 or from 3 to 4 has a cost, which is to deactivate one or two fleet power respectively. And remember, if you don't have enough fleet power to deactivate, you must recall fleet power from the map first and then deactivate it. Also note this icon on the border between tiers 0 and 1, and also on the border between tiers 1 and 2. This refers to improved technology cards, which I'll be talking about more in a later chapter. Essentially, you are limited on how many improved technologies you can have based on how many of these thresholds you have crossed. Agenda cards are one of the main ways you will score influence during the game. This effect allows you to gain an agenda. To do this, you have two options. Either take to your hand one of the four cards currently on display on the right side of the agenda board, replacing it with the next one from the top of the corresponding deck. Or draw two cards from the top of one of the decks, take one into your hand and put the other one on the bottom of the deck. You can take any agenda you want into your hand, and you can have multiple agenda cards in hand of any type or types. Also, agenda cards are never played through the effect of an action. They are only ever played during step one of your turn at the same time as when you play your focus card. Note that some effects allow you to take an agenda of a specific type, such as this one. You still have the choice to take the visible card or draw two cards from the top of the deck. Also, some of the effects in the game can cause a slot on the agenda board to become corrupted. If it is and you take an agenda of that type, you also take the corruption marker. You must then place that corruption on any legal position as mentioned earlier. It does not need to go on the agenda that you just took. You gain a trade token whenever you resolve this effect. When you gain a trade token, take the bottommost token from the galactic board and immediately gain the trade bonus printed to the right of the space or any space below it. So here you can gain two resources in any combination of food, materials and energy, or you can take a bounty token from the supply, gaining the benefit of it, or you can gain one science. Then place the trade token in front of you. At the end of your turn you will need to place it on an agenda card or lose it. The Escape Pods technology card also allows you to store a trade token on it. Note that you can spend a trade token on the same turn as you gained it if there is an effect that allows you to spend it, but what you cannot do is flip it over to gain an extra action. 
To do that, you must have had the token since the start of your turn. All of the trade bonuses are explained in the glossary. Each house begins the game with a specific basic technology based on their chosen Origins card. The technology tableau contains the other basic technologies available during the game. And there are improved technologies too. Each house has the opportunity during the game to upgrade their starting technology to an improved version. And the galactic board contains other improved technologies. You can gain a technology whenever you are resolving an effect with one of these three icons. When you gain a basic technology, take the top card from any of the stacks in the technology tableau. You cannot take a technology that you already have. Then resolve the immediate effect at the bottom of the card. For example, when you gain the targeting technology, you gain four influence, two energy, and then may deploy one corvette to your home sector. Next, tug the card into an available slot at the top of your house mat. Note that the text on the main part of the card is active as soon as you have the technology. So if you gain the Dreadnought technology, the immediate bonus is to deploy a Dreadnought, but you still need to spend one materials to do that. You are limited to five technologies unless you have conquered a fallen house, in which case you can have six, and technologies can never be removed. Each technology is fully described in the glossary and changes the rules for you in your favor. Ensure that all players are aware of the ability of your new technology. As mentioned earlier, even if a game effect allows you to build a starbase or to deploy any type of fleet other than corvettes, you can only do so if you have the corresponding technology card. To gain an improved technology, you first need to check if you are allowed to have one. Each player has their own improved technology card available to them by the side of their house mat. And if you remember back to setup, this blocking tile was placed over the improved technology cards on the galactic board. That means that none of these improved technologies can be gained in the first cycle of the game. At the start of the second cycle, that tile is removed, giving players access to the four improved technologies on offer. And at the start of the third cycle, any cards still there are removed and replaced by the other four improved technologies in the game. You are also limited to the number of improved technologies you have based on the position of your markers on your civilization tracks. For each threshold you have crossed depicting the improved technology icon, you can have one improved technology. So here you can have a maximum of three improved technologies. Two because this marker has crossed two thresholds and one because this marker has crossed one threshold. And finally, in order to take an improved technology, you must already have the basic version of it. When you gain an improved technology, it replaces the basic one, which is removed from the game. Gain the benefits printed on the bottom of the card, which is six influence and usually something else too. And again, it's polite to let your opponents know what your cool new stuff does so that they can take that into account when plotting against you. I said I wouldn't cover all of the technologies in this video, but I did want to explain a bit more about the different fleet types that you can acquire during the game and how they affect combat. For these explanations, I'm going to refer to fleet power by the names of the fleet. So when I say each corvette, I mean each fleet power of corvettes and not each corvette token. Let's start by reminding ourselves how corvettes work, which is the basic fleet type everyone has and is also the fleet type for the Voidborn. Corvettes have no effect on the approach step. In every salvo step, each corvette gains you one initiative. And that's it for corvettes, pretty simple really, unless you have technologies such as shields, torpedoes, targeting, etc, which all change the rules for corvettes in battle. Sentries are great for defending sectors. During the approach step, if defending, each sentry deals one approach damage. In each salvo step, if you are the invader, each sentry gains you one initiative. However, as the defender, sentries do not provide any initiative. If you only have sentries when defending, they will never hit back in the salvo step. Basic destroyers do nothing in the approach step, but improved destroyers deal one approach damage if you are the invader. Note that this is just one approach damage no matter how many destroyers you have. In every salvo step, each destroyer gains you one initiative, and if you are the invader, you gain one more initiative. Again, no matter how many destroyers you have. Also, once per combat, usually done in the first salvo, if you are the invader, deal one salvo damage for each destroyer you have. Dreadnoughts are big. When you're the invader, for each dreadnought you have, you gain one approach absorption. 
really useful when attacking a sector with sentries or sector defences. Each Dreadnought gains you one initiative in every salvo step, and you also gain one additional initiative as long as you have at least one Dreadnought. This applies if you are the invader or the defender. And if you are the defender, you also gain one salvo absorption for each Dreadnought. That's once per combat, not every salvo. The only difference between basic Dreadnoughts and improved Dreadnoughts is that basic Dreadnoughts are limited to one fleet power per token, whereas with improved Dreadnoughts you can have three. Carriers are large ships that contain smaller corvettes. In the approach step, when you are the invader, each carrier deploys one corvette. Remember, this can cause you to exceed the limit of two fleet tokens per sector. You only remove excess fleet tokens at the end of your turn. In every salvo step, each carrier gains you one initiative. Also, if you are the defender, you gain one salvo absorption for each carrier, once per combat, not every salvo. Like Dreadnoughts, basic carriers are limited to one fleet power per token, whereas improved carriers can have three. Star bases work like sector defences in combat, dealing one damage in the approach step for each star base when defending. Some of the houses have special abilities which are shown in the bottom right of the house mat. As usual, they are all fully explained in the glossary. And many of the houses have special rules which change a lot of what I've said in this video. For example, I said that in cycle 1, if your house mat is clear of corruption, you are safe from attack by the Voidborn. Well, that isn't true for House Shivius, who adds one extra Voidborn fleet power during the skirmish step. Some game effects allow you to resolve an action from your preferred focus. Your preferred focus is shown on the right side of your house mat, and you resolve one action from either of those focus cards, even if the card is in your discard pile. This does not, however, count as resolving the card itself, nor does it allow you to play a matching agenda. This icon allows you to peek at the galactic events for the next cycle. Look at the top two cards for the next cycle, put one back on top and the other on the bottom. Assuming nobody else resolves this effect, you now know what the event will be for the next cycle. And that is how you play Voidfall. To also help you learn the game, I'm planning a multiplayer playthrough and a solo playthrough, which you will find on my channel. And there'll be links to that in the description of this video. I hope you found this video useful. As always, please give the video a like, leave me a comment and subscribe to the channel. And as I mentioned earlier, I do rely on the support of my Patreon to keep the channel going. So if you are in a position to be able to do so, please visit patreon.com forward slash gaming rules for exclusive access to the gaming rules community and some extra bonus content. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.